Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cornerstone Barristers webinar on antisocial behaviour, the antisocial behaviour action plan and other updates. Um, and I can see that people are still joining, but given that we only have this hour scheduled, I'm going to make a start and uh, remind you that both the recording of this webinar and the slides that we're going to be using, which do contain some hyperlinks, are going to be available on our Chamber's website, hopefully later this afternoon and if not by tomorrow, and so you'll be able to re-watch this webinar uh, at your leisure and look at the slides in more detail should you wish to. The uh, viewing of the webinar, the recording isn't limited to those that were signed up for the webinar. So if you've got colleagues who you think might find the webinar of interest, feel free to share the link with them and they'll be able to view the webinar as well. Uh, we are going to be using the Q&A function during the course of the webinar. So if you do have any questions for the speakers, please feel free to put your question into the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer those questions as we go along and hopefully have some time at the end in order to um, sweep up any questions that we weren't able to pick up as we went along. Uh, just to let you know, as I say, I'm Kuljit Bogle KC. I'm a member of the public law team in Chambers. I also jointly head up the housing team and I'm joined by two speakers today, uh, Sarah Salmon and Alistair Cantor. They are both members of the housing ex team, both with extensive experience of acting in housing litigation. Both of them have uh, been involved frequently in cases involving ASB and uh, associated matters as well as the broader aspects of both housing and public law. And both Sarah and I, along with Jack Barber, were involved in a gang injunction last year, a three week gang injunction involving um, some gang activity in the West Midlands area. And so although we're talking about um, ASB in the 2014 Act today um, and some of the changes that are in the pipeline with regards to that Act and um, the uh, grounds for possession, we do have broader experience of both of antisocial behaviour matters but also of housing and public law more generally. And at the end of the slides, there'll be a slide that contains our email addresses, should you have any questions or want to follow up with any of us in relation to anything that we uh, touch on. So with that introduction, I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who's going to be covering the government's antisocial behaviour um, action plan. Thanks, Colgit. Um, I'll just let it get to the first slide. So I'm covering the Antisocial Behaviour Action Plan, which was published on the 27th of March 2023. At the same time that was published, so too was a piece of research entitled Antisocial Behaviour Impacts on Individuals and Local Communities. And you can find that on the government website, along with a number of guidance documents for ASB cases. The action plan itself contains a number of quotes from a range of sources, so from uh, victims of antisocial behaviour to officers that deal with antisocial behaviour, which has been taken from this piece of research. So I've just um, included a quote on the first slide from a, a witness um, who has experienced um, antisocial behaviour, uh, which demonstrates some of the feelings people can have when um, they are impacted by by such behavior and it is really indicative of why it is said the action plan has been produced in the foreword to the action plan written by the prime minister rishi sunak he comments that it is simply unacceptable that anyone should have to live in fear of intimidation from their neighbors or gangs terrorizing their streets that parks and children's play areas should not be littered with empty nitrous oxide canisters, that women and girls should not feel unsafe whilst walking alone at night, and that businesses or shops should not have to close down because town centres are no longer places that people want to be. And that gives you a sense of why it is said the action plan has been launched. And it, it there's a real emphasis on the fact that antisocial behaviour is not low level crime and not simply a nuisance. So turning to the next slide, you will see from the title there that the plan seeks to stamp out antisocial behaviour and it, it sets out that it has safety, security and basic respect for others at its heart. And I've already dealt with some of the motivations behind the act by reading um, some of the foreword out uh, in relation to slide one. 
But at the bottom of the slide there, I set out it, its main aims, and they are to change the laws and tighten regulations to clamp down on antisocial behaviour, ensuring that relevant agencies have all the powers and tools they need to contact uh, to combat, sorry, antisocial behaviour, and making sure antisocial behaviour is treated with the urgency, uh, with offenders facing uh, what is said to be immediate consequences. So I just want to pause there, uh, pause there, because many of you will recall the white paper back in 2012, prior to the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act 2014 coming into force. And that was entitled Putting Victims First, More Effective Responses to antisocial behaviour, just going to let the fire alarm practice stop. Um, and it, its aims were to empower victims and communities, introduce faster and more effective powers to stop antisocial behaviour and do more to help the police and other local agencies, including local authorities, to deal with antisocial behaviour informally. So, in a sense, uh, if anyone's read um, the full action plan, it's quite a le lengthy document. There's nothing new in the terms of its hopes, aspirations and aims. And I think some of us may agree that the difficulty with having such aims, for example, um, the tools uh, to deal with things more informally or get matters dealt with urgently, is that often it ends up with cases having to go to court. And the difficulties are that getting cases before the court on an urgent basis has become more difficult, it seems to me, more recently. Then you also have delays in the court process, which slows cases down. You also, of course, have um, defendants raising defences they're entitled to, but the nature of those defences, so for example, defences under the Equality Act, can often prompt complex and lengthy case management, which delays cases. Colder at the start mentioned a, a gang injunction trial that myself, her and Jack Barber were, uh, were involved with. That took nearly two years to come on. And although it was a three week trial, so unusual, we were dealing obviously with very serious gang related behaviour. And yet the court process and the case management involved with a large number of respondents, a large number of counsel on the other side, meant that the case wasn't, in my opinion, dealt with as swiftly as it, it potentially should be. And also, it, I've seen, especially again more recently, a hesitancy of the judiciary to make draconian orders, even in some of the most serious of cases. So despite a lot of the current powers being preventative, trying to stop antisocial behaviour before it occurs, there has been a shift that where there's underlying criminal behaviour, so for example, if someone's carrying a knife or there's other public order offences, there's there's becoming some pushback from the judiciary to, to really deal with that in terms of preventative orders. And it was reported in the Civil Justice Council's report of 2020 that many judges and practitioners feel that civil courts are, if you compare them to criminal courts, ill-equipped to deal with antisocial behaviour consisting of or including substantive criminal offences. And this can be seen, in my view, in the handling of such cases. So, the action plan, whilst it aims to do good things on the face of it, to empower communities, um, assist victims and prevent people from living in fear of antisocial behaviour, it's unclear how any of the changes proposed in the action plan will deal with the types of issues that uh, practitioners see on a, on a daily basis, especially when dealing with the courts. So let's look out. Uh, let's look at the next slide and some aspects of the plan itself. Now, the slide sets out the main headings within the plan. Uh, as I've already said, the plan's quite long, so I haven't got time to look at them all. But I just want to pull out uh, some aspects of it. So first, um, just considering tougher punishment, which was is one of the first things dealt with within the plan. It, it, it's aim is to bring in three main things. So immediate justice for perpetrators, cracking down on illegal drugs and encouraging orderly behaviour. Those are the three things the government says it aims to do. In terms of immediate justice, um, 
it, it effectively says that those found committing antisocial behaviour will be made to repair the damage that they inflict on victims and communities. And the ambition is to have this sort of justice start 48 hours after their offence. And also the aim is to involve the communities with the type of punishments and consequences a perpetrator would face. It is said that this will be a probation service delivered community payback uh, plan um, where the service will work with probation teams, members of the community uh, and local authorities to deploy um, rapidly to places where there's antisocial behaviour taking place so that there can be some sort of justice within the first 48 hours. In terms of cracking down on illegal drugs, which can be an issue in terms of housing and social housing, the government are intending to, to have a new ban on nitrous oxide and also um, introduce greater use of drug testing on arrest. So that's really going to be something where local authorities, social housing providers, and other practitioners in the area are going to have to work closely with the, the police and their uh, and all other relevant partners um, to get the information if there's been any sort of arrests in relation to uh, illegal drugs in, in or around their properties. In terms of the final uh, thing the government says it's going to introduce uh, under this head, the tougher punishment, the engaging orderly behaviour appears to be all about strengthening the powers in the social and private sector, uh, rented sector, to evict or sanction tenants who persistently commit antisocial behaviour that has a negative impact on their neighbours. Now, Alistair is going to deal with the possession side of this insofar as some of the changes within the plan are already being seen within the renters reform bill but the government also states that where premises are a source of nuisance they will consult on expanding closure powers so they want to give closure power, powers to housing providers currently it's a police or a, a local authority who can can use those powers in addition to that, the government says it will ensure existing powers are being used by setting clear expectations they are exercised in a timely fashion, and they will strengthen the position of social landlords by updating the allocations guidance, so effectively making it clear that where there is evidence of committing antisocial behaviour, that can be used to deprioritise somebody for an allocation, i.e. if you commit antisocial behaviour, you are put to the back of the queue for social housing. And secondly, they want to look at speeding up the process of removing antisocial behaviour perpetrators from their communities by essentially bringing in a three strikes and you're out eviction expectation for social landlords. This is explained in the plan as me meaning three proven instances of antisocial behaviour followed by three warnings from your landlord. It's unclear how the mechanism, if it's brought in, is going to work and whether three proven instances means that you, you need to satisfy a court, be it a criminal court or a civil court, of some sort of incidences, instances, or whether it's going to be a decision making function of a local authority or a housing provider to essentially find that instances have been proven. So uh, we'll have to see how that um, it, it is going to work in practice if it's brought in. The next uh, part of the plan I just want to touch on briefly is the reducing rough sleeping and begging. So, of course, the Vagrant Vagrancy Act is um, waiting a date for its repeal under Section 1 of the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act 2020. And effectively, the government's position is that nobody should be criminalised for simply having nowhere to live. And they want to shift the focus to prevention, moving vulnerable into individuals into multi-agency support. So in doing that, they aim to introduce new tools to direct individuals to engage with positive pathways. That will include accommodation, mental health support, substance misuse support, immigration or asylum services. So 
again, it's it, it, it's going to be seen how this will work in practice because often, um, as we know, especially in terms of people who are rough sleeping, um, it, it can often be difficult to get them to engage. So it'd be interesting to see what these new tools are in order to try and get positive engagement with relative uh, services. It will, however, um, prohibit organised begging, uh, which is often gang related to secure cash. And it will also prohibit beg begging where it's causing a public nuisance. And there's various examples within the plan, one of which is if someone's approaching somebody on the street or approaching someone on public transport and begging. So those are the types of things the guidance says it is going to, uh, the plan says the government are going to prohibit. It's also going to introduce powers for the police and local authorities to address rough sleeping and other street activity where it is causing a public nuisance. So things like tents, uh, paraphernalia, obstruction of doorways, things that can have an impact upon local communities. Finally, I just want to in touch on improving data reporting and accountability for action. So. It can often be difficult for victims of antisocial behaviour to know where they are to report things. They go to the police, the police say it's not my problem, it's, it, it's a social housing or a local authority problem. And sometimes vice versa if criminal offences are being um, perpetrated. So the idea is that members of the public will have a simple and clear route to report antisocial behaviour, be able to access advice and guidance all in one place and be updated on the outcome of their case. So again, not too dissimilar uh, from previous guidance um, that has been brought in in order to tackle antisocial behaviour. But it also says um, that the plan, one of the aims of the plan is to hold all local partners to account. So there will be the pub publication of guidance and, and clear expectations will be set on how local partners are to tackle antisocial behaviour. So on the final slide, I just sum up the main um, proposals that are designed to assist social housing and private landlords. And you can read them there on the slide. One thing I haven't yet mentioned is the extension of the power of arrest to breaches of all, uh, to all breaches of civil injunction. There is no detail in the action plan as to how this is going to work in practice. So um, that is something to keep an eye out um, in terms of the government legislating on that. Um, there's a number of issues set out there, which Alistair is going uh, to cover, and um, the two at the bottom there I've already been through, but, but this slide simply summarises uh, things housing providers need to be aware of. Um, I should say, however, that, of course, the plan is not limited to housing, and, of course, where you are listening to this webinar and you're in a local authority, it, it, there are other aspects of the plan which are going to be relevant to you so um, I'm now going to hand over to Alistair who's going to deal with the renters reform bill thank you Sarah um, good morning everyone I'm going to be talking to you about one of the first signs we've seen of the government actually taking steps to implement the action plan and that is specifically the renters reform bill um, including included amongst its proposed reforms are some that are relevant to the question of antisocial behavior if we could just go to the next slide please now the bill was introduced to the house of commons via its first reading on the 17th of may 2023 now, I've included the image on that slide, not only because I was sure most attendees would welcome seeing a large photo of Michael Goh first thing on a Monday morning, but also because it is his department that has introduced the bill, um, his department being the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Now, uh, before I begin to discuss the substance of the bill's proposed reforms, it's worth stressing, of course, that it's at a very early stage. 
It hasn't yet been debated in the Commons. It still has to go to the committee and report stages. And after that, the House of Lords. So I'll be discussing the reform bill as it stands today. But of course, uh, one should bear in mind it may yet uh, be amended, perhaps in more ways than one, before we actually end up with the final form. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Now, from the perspective of antisocial behaviour, there are two key aspects to the proposed changes to housing law. The first is proposed amendments to the wording of Ground 14 to Schedule 2 of the Housing Act 1988. And the second is a proposed obligation on private landlords um, imposing a duty on them to give their tenants statements of the terms of their tenancy. And I'll be discussing each of those two things in turn. If we could move to the first. So the first change envisaged by the bill, as I already mentioned, was amendments to Ground 14 of Schedule 2 to the Housing Act 1988, that is the ASB ground, it's a discretionary ground possession. And on this uh, slide, I set out on the left the current wording. Obviously, this is a ground that applies to assured tenancies as it's under the 1988 Act. So the current wording is there on the left hand side. And in the right column, I have put the wording of the ground as the bill would amend it. And I have highlighted um, the, the small, but some might say significant amendments to the ground in pink bold text. Essentially, we are changing uh, the criteria in terms of the conduct that will satisfy the ground from being either conduct causing or likely to cause a nuisance or annoyance to a person residing, et cetera, et cetera, to conduct causing or capable of causing a nuisance or annoyance to a person residing, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a slightly different test for where conduct hasn't actually caused nuisance or annoying. We're moving from it's likely to do so to merely it is capable of doing so. If we could move to the next slide, please. So what is the aim of the proposed amendments to ground 14? I say the answer is to be found at paragraph 31C of the action plan, which I have uh, reproduced on this slide. And the goal is, in my view, encapsulated in the text that, again, I have put in bold pink text. The goal is to make it easier for landlords to prove in court that there has been conduct meeting ground 14, that there has been antisocial behaviour and that they should be entitled to seek a possession order in relation to the guilty tenant. If we could move to the next slide. So the next question that arises, of course, is will the bill work? Will it achieve those goals? And in my view, there are two key categories to be considered um, when trying to answer that question. Uh, and the first I've noted on the left hand side, that is what approach will the courts take to interpreting ground 14 as amended? So, uh, and there are three matters to be considered. The first is how, how will judges actually interpret this? How will they approach a case? What will they say the test to be met actually is? Now, um, the change in the wording of ground 14 from likely to cause nuisance or annoyance to capable of causing nuisance or annoying or annoyance actually brings that ground in line with other um, housing legislation that aims to combat ASB. So, for example, that is the wording that, appear, that appeared in the now repealed Section 153A of the Housing Act 1996, which, of course, was the statutory provision underpinning the power to grant antisocial behaviour injunctions or ASBEs. Um, it's also in line with um, the statute that replaced um, that provision, 
the Antisocial Cri uh, Behaviour, Crime and Policing Act 2014, specifically section two thereof, which I'd imagine most attendees of this webinar will be very familiar because that is typically the provision which people employ to combat ASB. Now, um, the significance of that similarity in wording is that um, the, if ground 14 is amended in that way, um, the case law relevant to those other statutes is likely to become relevant and to be applied in relation to the amended ground 14. Um, but what does that actually mean? Well, there has been a range of reactions to the proposed um, amendment from um, housing law practitioners, which, which range from uh, it's a dramatic change which will have um, serious effects to really there's no qualitative difference between the old and new tests. In my view, in practice, it will mean that um, it will be easier to make the ground out. Um, the landlord will simply have to show that the conduct concerned is capable of causing nuisance or annoyance, and it need not have actually caused or even be likely to cause nuisance or annoyance to um, other residents of the lo locality, housing association staff, etc. However, while I think it will be easier to make the ground out, um, I also think it's unlikely to make a significant difference to more than a handful of cases. In my experience, um, most cases involving ASB, including possession claims involving ASB, will involve at least um, some element of uh, behaviour that is quite clearly ASB in the sense that it has caused nuisance or annoyance, or it is quite clearly likely to cause nuisance or annoyance. It might be that there are other um, particulars or allegations relied on that, that might not quite meet that test, but most cases there will be some clear-cut ASB involved. Uh, and so for that reason, I think lowering the bar um, will, will have an impact on only a, a quite a small number of cases. So, so that's the first issue in terms of predicting how the courts are going to navigate um, claims involving ground 14. The second is um, how willing will judges actually be to make possession orders? Let's say they say, right, this is conduct capable of causing nuisance annoyance, but it's not likely to cause nuisance or annoyance. Uh, my own suspicion is that um, most judges faced with that eventuality might well be reluctant to make a possession order or even a suspended possession order where the conduct being relied on is merely capable of causing nuisance or annoyance. Um, it might be perhaps only where past efforts, so for example, where there have been civil injunctions imposed under the 2014 Act, that they consider um, making some form of possession order where the conduct is merely capable of causing nuisance or annoyance. Now, um, I think under both my first points, uh, first two points, it, it's, it should be clear that there's a degree of uncertainty as to how judges will actually approach cases involving Ground 14, which brings me neatly onto my third point, which is that the action plan promises to bring forward further legislation um, about how judges um, should approach cases involving ASB. The action plan states that the government will bring forward legislation which will set out the principles that judges must consider when making their decision, such as giving weight to the impact on landlords, neighbours and housemates, and whether the tenant has failed to engage with other interventions to manage their behaviour. So I say based on, on that, we need to watch this space and wait for the promised further legislation as and when it emerges because um, when they bring that legislation forward, they may well include guidance or instructions on how judges are to approach possession claims involving ground 14. So that deals with the, the first key area, um, which will influence whether the amendments to ground 14 will have any, uh, any meaningful effect. The second is something already touched upon by Sarah, specifically court administration. Now, um, 
I think most social landlords will appreciate that having short notice periods and easing the burden of proof in ASB claims will not assist in addressing ASB in a timely fashion if county court under-resourcing, over-listing and maladministration hobbles a landlord's efforts to take swift action. And in my experience, that is often um, the bigger issue in ASB cases proceeding through the county court rather than any issue with judicial interpretation. Uh, for the most part, in my experience, judges being fairly sensible when dealing with ASB cases. Now, what the action plan says the government will do about that specifically is that it will look at speeding up the process of evicting an antisocial tenant by working with His Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Services to explore how to prioritise antisocial behaviour cases in possession lists in the courts. Now, there's no further detail about exactly how they intend to achieve that. Um, there's no um, indication of, of how they will accomplish this, um, let alone without a knock-on effect on listing times for other possession claims, for example, rent arrears. Uh, and again, in my experience and the experience of many of my colleagues here, um, leading times to get a first possession hearing in many county courts are, are, are reaching quite preposterous levels. So really, we need to see the detail from the government as to how they intend to get ASB cases on quicker without upsetting the apple cart across possession claims as a whole. The other thing the action plan doesn't mention is uh, whether and how the government intends to speed up the eviction process, because again, it should be a familiar problem to most people on this webinar, that even once you've got your possession order, um, the way things are at the moment, you have to wait a very long time for, for the county court bailiffs to actually evict the tenant. And um, all those things hobble a landlord from taking prompt action. Now, in my view, this really is the key point. I think if the government want to make um, action taken via possession claims swifter and more effective for ASB claims, um, the county court ha has got to be resourced um, more appropriately. Uh, and I leave it uh, with each of you um, to make your own minds up on how likely um, the commitment for the resources will actually be. If we could move to the next slide, please. Um, right, so the second key proposed amendment um, that will come in under the Renters Reform Bill, I just want to cover briefly. Uh, the, bill, the bill proposes that a duty be placed on private landlords to provide their tenants with a written statement of such terms of the tenancy as are specified by the Secretary of State and any other information the Secretary of State may specify. The um, regulations actually setting out those specified terms and or other information is awaited, but I anticipate they may include content prohibiting ASB. Uh, and the reason I say that is because the action plan at paragraph 31A specifically states that the government intends to ensure that all private tenancy agreements include clauses specifically banning antisocial behaviour, making it easier for landlords to use the breach of tenancy ground to evict antisocial tenants. So I think what we're going to see is some sort of uh, regulation saying landlords, you must provide them with a written statement, and it must include the following terms. Um, again, whether or not that will actually make any qualitative difference to how landlords deal with these matters is to be seen. In my experience, many private tenancies include clauses that will prohibit um, antisocial behaviour, but we shall have to watch this space. Um, that concludes um, my part of the presentation. I'll keep an eye on the Q&A in case anyone has any questions about anything that I've said. Otherwise, I will hand over to Kuljit. Thank you, Alistair and Sarah. Um, so I'm going to be covering a few uh, recent developments in the world of ASB. And in terms of the topics I'm going to be covering, there are three uh, headlines. 
Firstly, the case of Love It from Wigan uh, Borough Council. It's not especially recent, but is important in relation to um, how sentencing ought to be approached when there is a breach of an injunction order. We've then got the Leeds and Persons Unknown case, which is recent and involves closure orders. And then finally, a recent decision relating to Peabody and the Housing Ombudsman as um, a relation to how uh, Peabody dealt with some complaints of ASB, which ultimately led to the tenant um, leaving their premises because of the poor way in which those complaints have been managed. So I'm not going to spend too much time on uh, Love at the Wigan, simply because, as I say, it's not especially recent, but it is important. Uh, this was a case which involved three conjoined um, uh, applications for a Section 1 injunction, where there had been a breach of those injunctions. And there have been a variety of approaches taken by the judges in relation to the way in which those um, breaches have been punished. And there have been a suggestion, both in the course of um, litigation, but also more broadly, when one looks at the civil justices um, report into antisocial behaviour, that um, there is a, there's a great variation between sentences between uh, judges and between types of behaviour. And in one of those cases, there was a suggestion that the sentencing had been excessive. In another of the cases that the court was concerned with, there was a suggestion that in a case that involved loud banging and playing of amplified music, that the judge that made the order and then also dealt with the committal had failed to take into account that the defendant had some hearing problems and whether or not that was right. And the court found that it wasn't right, but that was the context. And then the third uh, appeal, which was one that involved Wigan, was a case where there had already been 177 breaches of the order proven, and there were a further 21 breaches that the judge was having to deal with in relation to the committal application. Uh, he made a sentence of 30 weeks in custody to run concurrently from another custodial sentence that the tenant already had. So you can see there that the um, sentence was significant and uh, sentences can be significant. There is, of course, the ability to impose a maximum of term of two years. Although in the vast majority of cases, you, you, no doubt your experience is going to be similar to mine, which is that certainly with the first breach or for the first few breaches, judges will very often suspend the sentence and um, impose conditions as to behavior in the interim. And at the bottom of that slide there, I've, I've put the various options that are available. It's very rare to get to the point of an immediate order for committal to prison. And in the cases where that has happened, I have to say that there's been a bit of panic at the court in terms of what one does, because of course, these matters are dealt with at the county court where there very often aren't secure holding facilities. There aren't um, prison officers or other people on site that could then uh, transport the person to prison, unlike criminal cases where the courts are equipped in a different way. And um, often one has to find the folder that's hidden somewhere that has the procedure in there in order to then figure out how one, uh, uh, to, how the prison sentence that the judge has imposed can actually be put into effect. So there are a range of options available but there. But what the court said is in relation to what we were doing historically with sentencing uh, for committal, we have been using the guidelines that exist for breaches of criminal behaviour orders. And those guidelines are created by an independent body called the Sentencing Council. And they exist for all, or rather not for all, but for many criminal offences. Not, not all of them have sentencing guidelines, but many of them do. And certainly some of the more commonly occurring criminal offences have guidelines attached to them. And that's the way in which magistrates' courts and Crown courts will deal with uh, sentencing in terms of deciding which sentencing guidelines apply and, and then um, working out the sentence according to the guidelines within the, the, the sentence the case specific guidelines. Uh, what we've been doing by using the criminal behaviour order guidelines is actually using a set of guidelines for powers that had up to uh, where the court had the power to imprison for up to five years so significantly longer than the breaches that are, or the powers that are available to sentence in respect of breaches of injunctions. And although that had been, approach had been approved by the court in the Amicus Horizon case, what the court said in this case was that was no longer the appropriate um, way in which to approach sentencing, and that they, the court ought to use guidelines that have been suggested 
uh, in the recent report of the Civil Justice Council. So that's the way in which we ought to be dealing with uh, uh, sentencing of uh, breaches of injunctions now. And on this slide, what I've set out is the table that exists for um, categorizing a breach and also the um, categorization of both culpability and harm. And as I say, this approach very much adopts the approach that judges in the criminal context are required to adopt, which is that you look at the culpability or the seriousness of the breach, and then you look at the harm. And if you decide it's a category A harm case and a category two, sorry, category A culpability, category two harm, you go to table A, go down to category two, and you'd find that the starting point for sentencing is three months with a category range of an adjourned consideration to six months imprisonment. And so what the court is supposed to do is take the three month starting point and then look at any aggravating or mitigating features when deciding whether or not to impose sentence. And the sorts of things that can be uh, relevant are the fact that there might be a history of disobedience of court orders, uh, that there might be a particular vulnerability of the victim, of the behaviour concerned, or that there is a persistent history here, which means that of itself there is an aggravating feature to the um, culpability. And in, uh, against that, there, there are, might be mitigating factors that are involved in relation to the defendant or the circumstances, and one of those might be that somebody has expressed genuine remorse for their actions, it might be that they have Ill, Ill health or that there's an age or lack of maturity in relation to when these actions were taken, uh, took place. And so it, it's very much about identifying the starting point and then moving up or downwards according to the various aggravating or mitigating features that apply. And it's, it's, it's worth noting that this is, um, not only is it relevant to look at this as being the existing approach in criminal courts, but also that concepts such as the custody threshold, so whether or not this is a case that even warrants custody, have been met. Uh, and then obviously, if it's um, appropriate, the court will look at whether the sentence ought to be suspended. But also that concepts such as totality are relevant, and there are separate guidelines in relation to totality that can be found on the Sentencing Council's website, and it's worth looking at those because they explain the steps the court's got to go through, and, and if you're wanting to assist the judge as to his approach, his or her approach to sentencing, uh, it's something that uh, he may well need to have drawn to his attention, because if there are five breaches, it's not simply a case of saying, well, each, well, each breach warrants 28 days, and we add up five lots of 28 days. You have to look at the offending and the sentencing that is appropriate in the round in total and decide whether or not it's appropriate given the circumstances. And so it, it's worth, as I say, looking at both the um, guidelines in this uh, case in Lovett, but also the totality guidelines, which you can find on the Sentencing Council's website. Um, so that's Lovett. Apologies for the noise. The gardeners have decided they're going to be doing something outside at the exact moment that this webinar is go um, going on. Um, I'm then going to cover the case of Leeds and Persons Unknown. And um, I was trying to find an image to demonstrate the kind of behaviour that we were concerned with here. I was instructed for Leeds in this case, and it's a, an application involving uh, closure orders for three different areas within Leeds. And what was going on there is what a lot of ASB professionals will, will know as car cruising or car meets. And um, when I Googled um, car meets or car cruising, I came up with two very different types of images. And you've got the vintage car, calm, you know, fairly civilized meet happening on the left. And then you've got what leads were dealing with here on the right, which was very much the boy or girl racers with their souped up vehicles. Uh, I think that vehicle's doing what's known as a donut. Um, and you can see there that there are lots of people standing on the periphery. Very often, these events are treated as families day out, days out, and they have there are adults as well as children there. And you can see there's no protection, there's no fencing or gating or any other way for them to be kept safe from what's going on um, in the locality. And so they are they can be very dangerous. And I have been involved in cases where there have been car meets where there have been fatalities, and that's why. The local authority have then sought to take action to prevent further meets and so it was against that background of a car cruising that this uh, injunction or rather this uh, closure order application had been made they'd got their first three-month closure orders 
But when they came to extend their closure orders, uh, the magistrates court said no. And it was that refusal of making the extended orders that we appealed to the Court of Appeal. And there are two issues that the court um, looked at that are going to be relevant that I'm going to talk about briefly. So first of all, these were the terms of the uh, closure orders that the local authority had obtained. And what you'll see there is that they, the premises have been described, you've got the descriptions there, this one's no Thorpe Gate, but there were two others. And essentially they were a combination of either industrial estates or um, on their own or industrial estates that had some aspect of residential accommodation on them as well. But they involved drawing a, a line around the area affected, which included highways, included um, commercial premises and um, residential premises and uh, using a map to identify the area that was affected. And you'll see there that what the orders did is they prohibited entry to people who were participating in car cruising or car meet events. Uh, and that wording is going to be relevant to the um, second of the two issues that the Court of Appeal considered, uh, which the judge described as the prohibition issue. But the first issue which arose was the premises issue. Um, and what the Magistrates Court had done is given four reasons for refusing the order. Um, and one of the issues that arose was how does one define premises for the purposes of a closure order? And then secondly, how is that order formulated in order to identify the access that is or isn't permitted? Um, and I'm going to deal with the premises issue first of all. So you'll know that um, in, in the Act, premises are defined within the legislation in section 92 in the words that are set out in pink on that slide. And what Mr Justice Fordham decided in um, considering these three uh, cases was uh, contrary to the submission that I'd made, that limb A doesn't have the universal and all embracing meaning attributed to it. So the argument that Leeds made was that, well, this is about any land or other place, because that's what the legislation says. And it's quite clear that that place doesn't have to be enclosed, uh, but it might be. And it's also clear that you don't have to have that land or other place attached to a building or structure. Um, the judge said no. Um, in his view, premises meant something objectively identifiable. And, and he uses this phrase in the real world, on the ground, uh, a couple of times in the judgment. But in, in his view, that it, you have to be able to identify the property, in effect, that's being closed. And um, I've set out some of the judgment on the slide there. Uh, it, it's rather odd because he does go on to cite some of the guidance that applied for old closure orders to say that, well, you can close fields and paths and things. But at the same time, his view is that it, this uh, premises have to be objectively identifiable. Um, in particular, of relevance to some of the work that, that we might do um, in the closure order world is that premises are not an area, they're not a locality, and they're not a line on a map or plan, nor do they include a highway. And he made reference to the PSPO part of the legislation to say that, well, for PSPOs, there's a specific um, section of, that le of the legislation that requires the local authority to think about how highways are affected. And that's missing from the closure order section of the 2014 Act. And therefore, that's another um, uh, piece of support for the view that the judge took that you can't have um, highways included within your premises. And um, so, so the view the judge took was that you have to have an identifiable property, um, which may or may not include open land with it. But uh, it, it's not just drawing a line on a map. And um, so that was the, the, the view he took on premises, rather unhelpful when it comes to some of the uh, premises that we sought to close to date. Uh, on the other issue, the prohibition issue, the judge held that uh, one has to, what the judge what the the expectation is that the order has to identify the people that are accepted from the prohibition. So you can have an order that says it's close to everybody except the following people. But you can't have an order that says it's close to the people involved in car cruising. So you've got to identify the exception. Now, it seems to me that certainly the prohibition issue is capable of being um, 
accommodated in the way in which we draft our closure orders. So you can close a premises from nine till five, or you can keep it open from five till nine. It's, it's about the wording that one uses. And, and so it seems to me that at least this aspect of the decision um, is potentially not as problematic as the first aspect. But certainly as far as premises are concerned, I can see cases where we've closed premises in the past, which we would not be able to close under um, this, this interpretation that Mr Justice Fordham has given to the legislation. And what we're left with is a need to consider very carefully whether the premises that we're proposing to call close fall within the definition as interpreted by Mr Justice Fordham until such time as that may be overturned and, and there is an appeal. But until that point, um, in the absence of um, any further decisions on this, Mr Justice Fordham's interpretation of premises uh, uh, bites, it applies. And it means that you have to have look at property that's objectively identifiable. And it seems to me what that means is that you can have premises where there is land attached or which accompanies um, uh, the, the property or the building, but the open spaces are a bit more problematic and need careful consideration. Uh, my own view is that it seems to me that there are going to be some open spaces that are still capable of being closed because they can be objectively identified as being property but there are going to be other types of open spaces where it's not going to be possible to close uh, them under the closure order powers because of the limited or restrictive way in which uh, premises has been uh, uh, interpreted. So uh, what we're left with are situations where we had potentially used closure orders in the past, but won't be able to use them going forward. And I flagged there some of the other options that are available to you in the circumstances where uh, you fall outside the definition, as Mr Justice Fordham has, has interpreted it, um, to look at things like PSPOs or Section 222 injunctions, or even um, Section 1 injunctions, even for things involving group activity, where you can identify the organisers or the ringleaders. Uh, but it, it does mean that each case is going to have to be carefully considered, uh, unlike what we might have been able to do historically in terms of put a line around a map, that's not going to be possible anymore. And it may be that you need to get advice specific to the circumstances um, that you're dealing with. I'm, I've got an eye on the time, I'm conscious that I rattle through that, but I just want to cover the last of the three topics I was going to uh, deal with. And that's this ombudsman decision relating to Peabody. Um, I, I've put some extract on there of how the um, case came to be considered by the uh, ombudsman. But essentially this was uh, an individual who had been complaining about antisocial behaviour for a considerable period of time. Um, she had a terminally ill husband and the ASB, which took the form of ma mainly of noise nuisance, was having a, an adverse impact on him. And she'd complained, she'd sent videos and what had happened is that because the officer with conduct was on long-term leave, that footage wasn't watched, the um, complaints weren't actioned and uh, there was no one really there monitoring the complaints and then deciding what action, if any, was appropriate. Uh, and so they, the, what the Ombudsman found was that there'd been a failure to consider all of the tools that were available to Peabody, including some of the non-legal tools. Uh, the report from the, on the Ombudsman website, and there's a link on the slide to the report, doesn't identify which of those non-legal tools the Ombudsman was envisaging or thought could be used in these circumstances. But one can imagine that it would be the more informal measures that we often take as a stepped approach to antisocial behaviour in terms of meeting with the perpetrator, maybe writing a letter, uh, looking at ways of um, whether there's scope to mediate matters or un uh, allow each party to understand uh, the lifestyle of the other if it's a lifestyle related issue. And it looks as though none of those measures were explored. And the, the ultimate um, uh, outcome was that this tenant gave up her tenancy. She terminated her tenancy and left because she felt that was the only way to remove herself from this situation, uh, which can tells you something about how serious it must have been and, and the impact on her. Because, of course, you know, people giving up their tenancies is not something one comes across uh, all that often. 
the chief executive was ordered to apologize and Peabody were ordered to pay £2,000 in compensation and review the way in which they manage antisocial behavior. So just a, a warning to us that it, we need to be thinking about not just the uh, legal tools, but also the non-legal tools that are available to us uh, and making sure that you have processes in place to ensure that complaints are actioned in order for um, residents, both complainants and perpetrators, to feel that complaints are being taken seriously and insofar as perpetrators need support, that that support is being provided to them uh, or that education or the, the strong words of advice uh, or ultimately um, legal enforcement if, if none of that works. So that's a, a quick run through three recent developments. I'm going to uh, invite the panellists to look at the questions on the Q&A and um, consider whether there are any of those that they want to uh, answer. But before I open it up, I'm just going to remind everyone that joined late that this webinar has been recorded and both the recording and the slides will be available on the Chamber's website, hopefully later today or tomorrow, and you'll be able to review those at your leisure. Alistair and um, Sarah, are there any questions in the Q&A that you'd like to deal with or anything else you'd like to pick up on? I think we've dealt with most of the questions. There's a few questions in the Q&A that have come in specifically for you on the car cruising case. So okay. I don't know. I haven't had a chance to look at those. Let me just cast my eye on those. Well, I think it, one question is whether the Leeds decision is being appealed. I think you've alluded to that. And my understanding is they are seeking permission to appeal. Well, they're thinking about it. Thinking I think about they, it. That, that certainly they've, um, because obviously there are cost implications of appealing and as a local authority, those are things that, you know, you all have to be mindful of. Um, but that's something that's being actively considered. Um, but we haven't got um, to the point of any appeal being issued yet. Uh, but obviously it's a case of watch this space. Um, Okay, and the second one, the second one is, is in the car cruising case, was consideration given initially to use injunctive relief against persons unknown rather than closure powers? Would this be the approach to use moving forward, given the incorrect, in my view, decision by the judge? Well, Phil, I can tell you I agree that it's incorrect, <laughs> certainly as far as the premises issue can, is concerned. I think the prohibition issue, I can see where the judge is coming from and, you know, suitable drafting can deal with that. I, I do agree the judge is wrong on the premises issue. Um, whether a 222 or some other uh, injunctive relief is appropriate has to be looked at very carefully. With, with section one injunctions, as you know, you can't get the section one injunction in respect of persons unknown. They have to be named individuals. And you could do that in respect of the organizers or the ones that are the most prolific. I, I don't know enough about the background at Leeds, but certainly other car cruising cases I've, I've been involved in. One of the problems is identifying the people involved very often because they're wearing helmets and um, very often because when the police give chase, um, it, it, they they remove things like their number plates, any identifying features. And it can become quite dangerous to pursue people on um, souped up vehicles. And so it means that identifying individuals becomes quite difficult. Um, as far as persons unknown are concerned, I, I don't think that's necessarily straightforward. The, the door's still open following the um, decision in Canada Goose, and um, Sarah might have a view on this as well, having been involved in some of that litigation. But um, I think you'd have to think carefully about whether you had the evidence and were able to justify a 222 application, say, in respect of persons unknown. I suspect the more appropriate solution is going to be a PSBO. And that leads to the second question that's been answered in the Q&A, um, which is that the revised guidance, if, if those of you haven't seen it, they, they tend to revise the guidance and not tell anybody about it. So e each time you look at a case, do check the guidance because they've slipped in a suggestion that a two week period of consultation on a PSPO would be appropriate or adequate. In fact, they say up to two weeks consultation so the implication there is that you could consult for a shorter period. I have to say, I think it depends on the subject matter, but the more controversial the subject matter, the uh, longer your period of consultation is likely to have to be. And um, what the case law around consultation says is that you have to have a meaningful consultation. 
you have to give people enough information about what you're proposing and then give them a proper opportunity to engage with it. And, and two weeks just feels like quite a short period of time. Now, I mean, I suppose if you're in challenge territory, you could rely on the cops of the guidance to say, well, the guidance says, you know, up to two weeks is adequate. But if you're proposing a PSPO on something that's a controversial subject matter, I think you have to think carefully about whether two weeks is actually adequate for you to bring in um, a PSPO, which affects everybody within uh, a particular locality, the more uh, onerous the requirements or the more controversial the subject matter, it seems to me you need to be cognizant of that. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to say anything on the person's unknown injunctions, because I know you've been involved in some cases involving that. Yeah, so I was involved in the um, trespassing on land persons unknown injunctions. And in the High Court, I'm sure many of you will know, they were unsuccessful, but the Court of Appeal um, allowed the appeal that was brought by Wolverhampton um, City Council and other local authorities um, and reinstated the injunction orders in relation to trespassers and persons unknown. My understanding is that I wasn't involved at the Supreme Court case. My local authority um, dropped out of the litigation. But my understanding is that the case has been heard by the Supreme Court. I think it was heard in February, but I'm not sure. I think the Supreme Court uh, website is telling me that judges, uh, judgment is awaited. So I still think there are question marks in relation to person unknown injunctions. Having said all of that, I am aware that I think Stevenage has been um, successful in 2023 getting a person's unknown injunction against car cruisers. You can see that online. And I think um, Birmingham City Council, uh, Wolverhampton and other West Midlands City Councils have also um, obtained person's unknown injunctions for car cruising. So it's definitely a tool that is still being used and injunctions are still being granted. But I suppose we need to await the outcome of the Supreme Court case to see whether it gives any more guidance in relation to person unknown injunction applications. Excellent, thank you. Is there anything either of you want to say before we wrap up the webinar? All right, well, thank you very much for those of you that have in, in joined us online. Um, if you do have any further questions, on the last slide, I've included a list of our email addresses. Do feel free to follow up with us. And um, as I say, uh, have a look at the, the recording and do feel free to share the details of the webinar with anybody that you think might be interested. Many thanks.